Good morning. All right, so today, uh, happy Mother's Day. We are going to talk about singleness on Mother's Day. Uh, you know, sometimes God has a sense of humor, and I just want you to know that I'm fully aware uh, that, like, as a pastor, we've been talking about marriage for the last six weeks or so. So about right after Easter, we started into a series on redeeming marriage. And like, marriage is difficult. Marriage is its own unique animal. And so we've talked through how do we have a marriage that is God-honoring and glorifying. But over the course of that, there have been conversations in our home, particularly with, you know, my seven-year-old, uh, about, well, God, I'm, Dad, I'm not married. What about me? I'm single. Like, and you know what? She's like, can I not serve God? Mm-hmm. And she's absolutely right. Matter of fact, I told her, you know what? I'm not going to get out of this series on marriage without teaching a, a sermon on redeeming our singleness. Uh, because there, there are seasons of life. And we're blessed in this church to have singles. And as it turns out, there are single seasons. Like, so there, there are seasons of singleness. Like my, my seven-year-old is very concerned that can I serve God as a single person? And she's seven. And she said, Dad, I know you're teaching on singleness this Sunday, and I have to be gone for my camp out. She said, will you record it so I can watch it? It's the first time my daughter's ever asked to watch the recording of the Sunday sermon. But it tells you that she's paying attention, like, and she's alert to what's going on, and she knows where we are in the series, and she knows that she can learn. She knows that she has value in God's kingdom. And the, the crazy thing about singleness is that the overwhelming majority of missionaries— are single people. Uh, the Southern Baptists have uh, 50-ish missionaries uh, serving in North Africa and the Middle East, like in the hardest parts of the North Africa and the Middle East, and almost all of them are single women. Almost 100%. It's like 90% of them, 95% of them are single women serving in North Africa and the Middle East. <laughs> Why? Hmm. Like they're redeeming their singleness. Like, and so on this Mother's Day, like I want to talk about how do you have value in the church as a single person that we love you. And you know, Mother's Day is this kind of tricky holiday because on one hand it's like, yay, mom, I love my mom, I love my wife, and I love my children. Like, and at the same time, like that actually represents a fraction of our congregation. Uh, that we all have mothers, okay, I got that. Like, but only a, f a handful of us have mothers that are still living or mothers with whom we have a healthy relationship. Like, and it creates kind of an interesting dynamic on this particular holiday. And I, you know, I'm looking through my preaching calendar, I'm going, I hit singleness on Mother's Day. What are you doing? I'm like, and I, I, had a long, I had an hour long conversation about my wife about changing the preaching calendar because I was like, I'm not preaching on singleness on Mother's Day. And she was like, no, man, just do it. Like, Lord, okay, so here we go. We're going to talk about singleness. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, so we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul writes specifically about the nature of singleness. Now, uh, he has previously in this chapter taught about marriage and divorce, and we're going to come down to the end of the chapter. We're going to talk specifically about what he says to singles. Like, and how they are both valued and valuable in the church. Um, so if you would, pray with me, and then we'll dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your presence today. I thank you for being with us in the midst of our service. I thank you for your sense of timing and sticking me in an uncomfortable text on Mother's Day. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts through it, and Lord, I pray that you would make yourself known more to us. I pray that those who've given the gift of singleness would see their value and be encouraged. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless them for the service that they uh, give to, to your kingdom. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 25, the Apostle Paul addresses singles. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think then it is good in view of the present distress that, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Don't seek a wife. 
But if you marry, you've not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. But I say this, brothers, that the time is shortened. So from now on, those who have wives should live as though they had none, and those who weep as those who did not weep, those who rejoice as those who did not rejoice, and those who buy as those who did not possess, those who use the world as those who did not make full use of it. For the, for the form of this world is passing away. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord and how he may please the Lord. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world and how he may please his wife. His interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be both holy, both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Therefore, I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Thank you. So, Herein lies a uniquely difficult text. Okay, the exegesis here, the, the, the digging in and the diving in is a little bit difficult, and I'm going to try to do my best to make it pretty simple. Like, in verse 25, he begins now concerning virgins, which is a blanket term in the Greek for unmarried people. Like, it's unmarried men, it's unmarried women, like, it, it's, a bl it's a blanket term for people that aren't married. And he uses basically the same word when he calls them unmarried in a later verse. He says, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion. As one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. Um, this particular verse gets all kinds of attention from lots of different scholars. Because what do you mean Paul said he doesn't have a direct word but he's giving his opinion. Therefore we should disregard everything after it. No. Okay. Like, all that means is Paul doesn't have a direct line of a vision of word for word. Write this down. But he... But we know that Paul's writings are inspired, that he is writing down the words of God, even though God didn't necessarily give him a word for word and write it down. That God inspired the words as he wrote them. And that is why he is considered to be one who's, uh, by the mercy of the Lord, is trustworthy. That he didn't have a clear vision on this. But everything he says here is authoritative. Everything he says here is the words of God that God would have us to understand. Like, and the essence of this, like is there's freedom. There's freedom to marry or not to marry. Okay? And ultimately, that God has given us great freedom in this life, whether we marry or don't marry. He says, I think it's good in view of this present distress that a man remain as he is. Like, that there is a huge, huge concept here called contentment. That God calls us whether we are married or not married, to find contentment in our unique circumstances. Okay? And what he's talking about here, he says, are you bound to a wife, verse 27? Don't seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Don't seek a wife. Like, like are you married? Okay, you're like, we're going to stay married. You're going to find contentment in the situation that you're in and work through the difficulties that, they are, that are there and stay married. Like, are you single? Like, don't, be consumed with finding a spouse. Okay, you single people watching. Like, don't be consumed with finding a spouse. Like, I want I will be very candid with you. Like when I was a young man, from the time that I was about 18 until <coughs> 21. Okay, so about three years, the first kind of three years of college. Like I I was fairly consumed with finding a wife. Like, I mean, I, I was, you know, a college guy at that point, and my friends were all dating seriously. Like, some of my friends from high school got married, kind of right out of high school within a year or two. Some of them were already divorced. Like, what? Like, and I was pretty concerned with, with trying to like, find a wife. I dated a different girl about every three months. I mean, like, seriously, I, I just dated a different girl about every three Nope, she's not the one. And I was on to the next. I mean, I had this agenda, like, no, I was going to find the one, and it didn't hurt, and it didn't hurt, and it didn't hurt. Like, I, I went to a, a conference, and I heard Tommy Nelson preach on, on, on marriage. First time talking to guys, and I discovered that the problem was not her. It was me. <laughs> it was painful. <laughs> I'm like, oh, 
He said, brothers, if you've been dating a lot of different women and you can't find the right one, chances are you aren't the right one. And I went, ooh. Uh, and so I decided I'm going to put this dating thing on hold, like for a while, and I'm going to figure out how to be a godly man. I'm going to, I'm going to focus on me and my character and becoming the man that God desires me to be. And I'm going to learn how to be holy. And I'm going to learn to deal with the sin issues in my life. And I'm going to learn to... Confess my sin to the brothers that God's given me to walk through life with. And like I'm going to learn to find some contentment in my state. Uh, like As a single guy, like I'm going to learn to be content. Um, that was rough. Uh, but I will tell you that the next woman I dated, I married. Like I, I went through a season of about five years. Like So I went from dating a different girl every three months to not date one for the next one I dated, I married. Like, but in that season of singleness, I worked really hard on this, on just learning to be content. This is where God has me. Like, now, I want you to know that there's freedom in verse 28. If you marry, you've not sinned. If a virgin marries, she's not sinned. Yet they'll have trouble in this life. And I'm trying to spare you. Now, this is a unique nugget coming from a single guy. Because I, I do not want it to be missed that the Apostle Paul is a single he never married, okay? Um, side note, rabbit trail. In, the, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul outlines the qualifications for pastors. In there, he mentions the pastor ought to be the husband of one wife. Like, I know churches that think that means the guy has to be married. But you know what? The guy who wrote that never was. Like, little nugget there. Okay, like no pastors don't have to be married. They just have to be the husband of one wife. And like if they're single, they can be like Paul and serve singly like for all of their life. Some of the greatest missionaries of all time were single people, men and women. Like we have offerings that we give that are named for career missionaries who were single women. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering is named for uh, Charlotte Lottie Moon. And guess what? She served as a missionary in China and never got married. Like, now, why? Verse 28, yet such, he says, if you, if you don't marry, if you do marry, it's not sinful. That marriage is okay. That marriage is blessed by God. It's a gift of God. And a good wife is more precious than rubies. But, verse 28, yet those who marry will have trouble in this life. And I'm trying to spare you. So Paul says, look, listen to me as a single guy. Trust me, stay single. It's better. Because as it turns out, marriage is difficult. Like, uh, and we've been teaching for the last five weeks on how to make it less difficult. Okay, How to redeem the difficulties that exist in our marriage. Because marriage, as it turns out, is a challenge. Um, and the, uh, I just find that humorous that a single guy says, I'm trying to spare you. Don't get married. Um, and the, when I, I was sitting down with a brother who was getting married in his early 30s, and I was probably in my mid-20s at that point. Uh, he, he's 8, 10 years older than I am. And we were talking, he was getting married in his, his early 30s. And he says, I've been married, or he said, I've been single 32, 33 years thereabouts. He says, and I'm really concerned that I have learned to be content in my singleness and what that really means is I am stuck in my ways. <laughs> like, because I'm about to get married and I'm scared to death. I've been, I've been single for my entire adult life and I'm about to get married and all, all of that's going to change. Um, and, and that's an accurate perspective. Sometimes single people get stuck in their ways. And, like, and they have their own unique challenges. Like, in verse 29 he says, the time is shortened. So when he says, though, from now on, those who have wives should live as though they have none. Like This isn't a command to disregard your wife. This is a command to value the things of the kingdom. The, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And there's this. it follows it up in verse 32. Like, I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord and how he may please the Lord. The one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. Like, perhaps the greatest apologetic for the value of Christian singles is that their interests are undivided. 
Their attention and their devotion to the Lord are undivided. Like, there was a season in my life where like, at 22, 23 years old, like, uh, I wanted to go overseas and serve as a missionary. And guess what? Just signed on a dotted line and went. Like, I didn't have to ask permission. I didn't have to deal with wife, grandparents. I didn't have to deal with, I mean, yeah, I, I'm going to go. And I signed up and I went. And I moved overseas, and I lived as a missionary. And you know what I had to worry about? Like, I learned where to eat. Like, I had Russian language class, so I had to learn where to go to school. Like, and the rest of my days, all I had to do was hang out with people. Missionary life is one of those unique blends of, the, I, you mean I get paid to hang out with people? This is a great gig. Like, because I got I didn't have children at home. I didn't have any of the distractions that I now have as a married man. Like, we're not present in my life. Now, how many hours a week did I work? All of them. Like, if I was awake, I was either devoted to, like, learning the scriptures and studying, or my daily task, learning the Russian language. Давайте, мы можем говорить по-русски. Хотите? Okay, they got nothing. Uh, we can speak, I can speak Russian. Like, I devoted myself to my studies. And then I got out of class, and I went and devoted myself to talking to other people about Jesus. I think this is what mission, this was my role as a missionary. Go talk to that guy. Okay, I can do that. Like, and along the way, yes, we're talking not just every conversation is not about Jesus. It's relational evangelism, which means we're talking about football and, no, soccer, man, the right football. Um, and we're talking about fishing, uh, and we're talking about activities that guys engage in. And guess what? Guys are pretty much the same the world over. They have the same four interests, and it's pretty easy to have a conversation with them. But we're just talking and hanging out. And somewhere in there, we're weaving in how does Christ influence my thought process. And we're talking about the gospel, and I'm sharing Christ's love and how he drew me out of darkness and saved me from myself. And basically I worked all the rest of the hours of the day because I didn't have any reason not to. Like I had a singular devotion to service. And like singles in the church have a unique opportunity to serve, both overseas as missionaries, like where the vast majority of missionaries are in fact single people. Like the they also have a unique opportunity to serve in our local church because you have an opportunity to not be distracted and to give the extra time that those of us who have wives and children are distracted by, and you can serve. How? You want to watch my kids? You can have mine. Like, you can babysit. You can bless a married family with some time together. Like, you can, you can serve in our garden anytime you want. I got volunteer hours out the wazoo for any single person that has extra time on their hands. And I know, I know singles who say, I'm super, super busy. Yes. Like, the question is, as a Christian, are you super busy about the things of the Lord? Because that's what they're supposed to be singularly busy about. Like, he is singularly concerned, or she is singularly concerned about the things of the Lord and how they may please the Lord. So you get up every day and go, Lord, how do I, how do I glorify you today in my life? Like, like, one who's married is concerned about the things of the world. How may, may please his wife? His interests are divided. It doesn't mean that as a married man, my interests are different. It means that they are divided. Like, I was 28 years old when I got married. Everything I owned fit in a Toyota Camry. Like all of my earthly possessions fit in a 1993 Toyota Camry when we got married. Like I'd been out of college for six years. Like I had lived in different states, different countries, traveled a lot. Like everything I owned fit in a Camry. Why? Like because I didn't have a reason to have more stuff. Like the last time we moved, I don't even want to think about it. Like, because it took three truckloads of, I mean, like, box truckloads of stuff to move our stuff the last time that we relocated uh, into our current house. And, 
Well, Meredith and I, have, we moved six times in the first five years of our marriage. I don't recommend that. Um, like, but we did because that was kind of how God had us moving. Like, can I just tell you about how much stuff it turns out? Like, I went from everything in a Toyota Camry to within a year and the first move. Like, how are we going to move all this stuff? And calling friends and trucks and trailers to get... Like, my interests were divided. Like, and I went from having to worry about, like, okay, I could hang out as a single guy. Like, I literally had gentlemen at times knock on my door at 11 o'clock at night and be like, hey, can we talk? I got this going on in my life. And I would be, sure, come on in. Like, you know, wipe the sleep out of my eyes. Like, I'm good. And we could talk till 4 a.m. Like, if you knock on my door now at 11 p.m., the only thing you're going to get is a barking dog. Like, because unless somebody is dying, like, it's going to wait till the morning. And that's because as a single guy, I had the ability to stay up the whole night. It wasn't a big deal. Like now, like today I was up at 6 a.m. because my allergies are killing me and I'm already tired. I'm like, geez, well, I need a nap. We're going to have a Mother's Day nap later. Uh, like the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world. And what that's talking about is I'm now, I own a house now. Like, I mean, woo, -hoo, I mean, great. I got a house. Like, I didn't own a house. I, like, I just, I lived kind of wherever. I wasn't homeless, but I lived in whatever tenant house I needed to live in for however long I needed to live there. And I just moved from place to place. Like, as a single who was devoted to the things of the Lord. Like, I just went wherever the Lord took me. Like, as a married guy, like, when Meredith and I were talking about going back overseas. So uh, there was an ongoing conversation in the early years of our marriage. We were planning to go back to Russia. I want you to understand that moving to Russia as a single guy was as simple as sign on the dotted line and buy the plane ticket. Moving to Russia with a wife changes the whole conversation because now we got to have a different type of apartment. Like we can't have roommates. Like I mean, we got to have our own place, which doubles the rent, by the way, because you got to have it to yourself. Like, and there's got to be some sort of a room where you can have parents come to visit. Because they are going to come to visit. And then you got to have a room for where the kids are going to sleep. So you got to have a two-bedroom apartment because you got to at least have the kids have a bedroom. you know. And all of a sudden, you've moved from like being able to live two guys in one room to now you're dealing with a crowd of people. And how do we have this? Oh, wait. So we moved from a, my apartment when I lived in Russia cost 300 bucks a month. I just want you to like, that's cheap. Like, even in Russia, by Russia, I lived in a $300 a month apartment. I split it with a roommate, paid $150 a month in rent. Like, to go back, when we were looking at going back in 2008, Meredith and I's apartment rent would have been somewhere in the, not changing cities, but we were looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,500 to $3,000 for an apartment. Like, just a different world when you get married. Like, your expenses go whoop, up here. Like, because you got... I drove a beater vehicle. Uh, when we first got married, I was driving a 1993 Toyota Camry that we affectionately called the Smoking Bandit. It leaked oil out of the rear main seal onto a manifold, and it smoked going down the highway, big cloud going out the back. Like, it cost more to repair that than it did to buy the car. So I was like, I'll just drive it. Uh, it'd be all right. I drove that car for a th I put 50,000 50, miles on that car. Um, and sold it for about what I had in it. I paid twelve hundred bucks. I sold it for thousand, I think. Like to like, because this is a single. It doesn't matter, man. It get there. Were, did it break down? Mm -hmm, yep. Like you know how frustrating that was. Like as a single guy, man, I can handle this. Like when you got kids in the back seat, the the necessity of more dependable transportation escalates dramatically. Like because I got. I mean, yesterday, I had Hosea for a couple of hours uh, after everybody left, and we were kind of still here. And he's got to eat, like now. I'm like, okay, I'm out of food. Sorry, Gene, I raided the crackers in the fellowship hall because I, I didn't prepare well enough to feed my four-year-old after everybody left, and he was hungry, you know? Like, my interests are divided. I'm trying to serve the Lord with a singular devotion, but I got this little person going, Dad, I'm hungry. And think, okay, I, I will stop what I'm doing, and I will make sure that you have a snack. Um, and I got folks out here trying to get their gardens in. And hope I need a drink. Okay, it's a different season of life. 
Like, both have value in the kingdom. Like, there is, it is neither right nor wrong. That it, it's, it, wives are a gift from the Lord. Husbands are a gift from the Lord to each other. Like, but singleness is also a gift. It has its unique opportunities. The most significant of those is an undevoted devotion to the Lord, undistracted devotion to the Lord. Like, his interests are not divided. The woman who is unmarried, verse 34, and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The goal in marriage is to have two people who are singularly devoted to each other. The goal is not for me to demand my happiness out of my wife or for her to demand happiness out of me. But for me to get up every day and go, how do I bless her? How do I make her life better? Regardless of whether or not that's reciprocal, regardless of whether or not she treats me that way, I get up every day and try to bless her. A single person gets up and goes, how do I please the Lord today? Like, that's a unique giftedness that God has given them. Like, now, I want you to understand, I mentioned seasons of singleness. Like, I was single until I was 28. I had a significant chunk of my adult life where I served the Lord as a single man. Like, my best friend was single until he got married at 30. I don't care, I'm going to age you. 36. Okay, so Carrie got married at 36. He served the Lord as a single man for about 15 years. Like, there are others that are serving the Lord for the entirety of life. That God does not give them a spouse, and they have the gift of singleness. I have friends who are missionaries in France, and they are long-term singles. Like, and that God has given them the gift of singleness. Uh, Gene, who I love, is a single man. Like, and he has served the Lord faithfully here at West Hills for decades. Like, because God has given him the gift of singleness, and he has blessed others by having a singular devotion to the Lord. That they're, that both have value in the kingdom. They have different roles. Like, but they both have great value in the kingdom. Paul's goal is not to put any restraint on us. Get married, don't get married. There's freedom here. Like, serve as I am. Like, because Paul, the single guy, says it's really better to be single, just so you know. Because from Paul's perspective, he's got it made. He's like, I don't have any of the distractions of this life. No. Paul was a rambling missionary for most of his adult life, uh, or for m most of his years of ministry. He traveled from place to place. It was a rough life. He got shipwrecked three times. Like, I would have got on different boats. Um, as a you know, husband, you're like, hmm. Do I trust this captain? Because now i got to evaluate. Am I going to drown my kids? Can I hold them out of the way? Paul doesn't care, man. God says, go to the next. I'm going. Like, there's a storm coming. Doesn't matter. I'm getting on the boat. <laughs> like, because Paul lives a fearless life where he's concerned singly about how do I serve the Lord. And, and married people have to be concerned about how do we serve our spouses? How do we bless our spouses? It's, it's marriage and singleness are different, but singleness is a tremendous gift. Like, and we have some who are single by death, that they are now widows or widowers like, because their spouses have passed. Like, one of my favorite saints in the Lord when I was a young man in the ministry was Miss Florine Everett. Uh, now, Florine was a little bitty lady. She's about the size of Dorothy. Uh, and Florine became an early widow. Uh, her husband died. They retired early at 59. Uh, and she was super excited about their retirement, that they had been good stewards of their finances, and her husband had a good pension, and they retired early at 59. And she was excited about life. And six months later, her husband died. 59 and a half. Like, it's like, ooh. And she spent some time being sad and grieving over that. And then asking the Lord, what do I do now? Like, and she started visiting senior adults at the nursing home. She started going to the nursing home, just visiting the senior adults. And, and praying with them and encouraging them and being someone that they could talk to and pray with. Like, and when I met Miss Florine, or maybe I should say, I knew her in the church some as a kid. But when I got to know her, when I was in the ministry, I was teaching at the nursing home. Miss Florine knew everybody there's name. Like, 
She prayed with all of those people. She had ministered. I said, Miss Flurry, I said, how long have you been coming here? She said, 28 years. I'm like, she was 87 at the time and still driving herself to the nursing home to minister to those folks. And God had given her a complete second career. She couldn't travel overseas as a missionary, but she had a singular devotion to the Lord. So like, after grieving the loss of a husband, when I had these great plans for my retirement, and God changed them. And he gave me these people to bless and to minister to. She lived into her early mid-90s. Like she was 94 uh, when she passed away a couple of years ago. Like, she, she had three decades of serving the Lord as a widow with a singular devotion to the Lord. Like, and she didn't see her widowness as something to be grieved over forever. Like, and she said, you know, this is a season that God has given me, and I'm still young and able-bodied, and I'm going to serve the Lord. She started serving, she was 59 and a half when she started serving the Lord at the nursing home, and she was still there at 87. Like, I said, did you? And she was still driving herself to the nursing home. At that point, she was older than most of the people there. She was still living at home on her own independently and driving herself to come minister to the people at the nursing home. God gave her exceptional health and a tremendous long life because she had a singular devotion to the Lord. Like, her interests were no longer divided. Like, I want you to know that on this Mother's Day, we value singles. Like, we value our mothers. I'm thankful for mine, and I know that you are thankful for yours. Like, but we value those who have a singular devotion to the Lord and don't have the distraction that little people are. Like, and they don't have the distractions that, that come with figuring out the finances and figuring out the... Don't get me wrong. I understand you have bills. Like, what I'm speaking of is, like, do we really need a new crib? Do we need a... You know, like, those types of decisions that married people have to deal with and singles don't. I'm like, that... Uh, do I have to? I have to ask permission for everything. That's just part of the marriage. Like, uh, there's a there's a fun guy T-shirt. It says, "Yes, I can." In the small letters. Let me ask my wife, because that's my life now. Like, yes, I can. Let me ask my wife. Um, as a single person, yes, I can. Like, the, the, those those roles are different. But the single people have a tremendous value in God's kingdom. Would you pray with me, Father in heaven? I thank you. For our mothers who have given us life and introduced us to you, so many of them have been role models in our lives and helped us to understand who you are and what you're like. Lord, for those who uh, today are grieving the loss of their mothers, we pray for them. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of children like or siblings that they've, that they've lost on this Mother's Day. Lord, I, I pray that you would encourage their hearts in knowing that those are with you, that Lord, I pray for those who you've given the gift of singleness on this Mother's Day. Like, as they wonder what if at times, as they wonder, Lord, why did you give them this gift? When they look around and they see others with their families or they're scrolling social media and they see the, the family pictures on this day, Lord, I pray that you would give them a sense of sweet contentment in where they are and the value that they bring to the kingdom and the... the the fact that they have tremendous uh, value, that we love them, that we appreciate them. Lord, I pray that today uh, you would give them an even greater uh, undistracted devotion to you and your service. Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we go from here in Christ's name.